Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. And if you live in Alaska right now, you are living in the snow. It is snowmageddon in Anchorage. They're getting so much snow, they don't know what to do with it. I am. Um, I hope that uh, the roads are clear, and I hope that uh, the mayor and his staff are able to get out there and plow those roads, because I know that kids are wanting to go to school and people are wanting to go to work. So uh, we have a very special treat today, a returning guest, Melissa Cook. She is an award winner, two awards for a book that she wrote about Alaska. She has her own jeeping channel on YouTube, which is very exciting. The book is called The Call of the Last Frontier. We're going to be talking about that book and more Welcome to the Must Read Alaska show, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. I am excited to sit down and visit with you again. Yeah, we. Uh, I think you're on about a year ago. We did a mm -hmm. book giveaway. We're going to do another book giveaway. So folks listening, you're going to want to go to our Facebook, Must Read Alaska's Facebook. I'm going to pin this full length episode to the very top. All you have to do to enter is like the post, comment on the post, share the post, take a friend, do any one of those four and you'll enter to win the book. We're going to be giving away two books. So I'm going to draw the name, draw <laughs> two names out of a hat, and I'm going to give those out on Sunday. So I'll do another video and we'll make sure to find you when we do that. But find the post. It's going to be pinned to the top of the Must Read Alaska Facebook page. Go like, comment, share, take a friend, and that'll enter you to win. Do all four of those. You get four entries. So um, we're going to have some fun with this. Uh, Melissa, but first, Tell me the story of you coming to Alaska. I know we touched base on it last time, but I think there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to hear this story for the first time. So tell us that story. What brought you to Alaska? We came to Alaska in 1995 to go out and be remote teachers in a bush community called Nelson Lagoon. And to get to that job, we had to go to the job fair in Anchorage. And at that time, there were a thousand teachers for 50 jobs. So when we got there, we needed 50, we needed two jobs in the same community and there were 50 for the entire state. So it didn't look good. <laughs> it, it, it was pretty frightening because we spent a lot of money coming up there to go to that job fair. But we were successful and found two jobs and we landed uh, in Nelson Lagoon. And when we flew into Nelson Lagoon, we flew in with a pilot named George Nathan and for 25 years, I only knew George by George. I didn't know his last name. But after I wrote the book, I called the Homer Airport where we flew out of. And I asked them if they could tell me George's last name. And they laughed at me because it had been 25 years. And I said, well, you know, Alaskans help other Alaskans. So could you please help me find George? And they did. And so I was able to get George Nathan's name in the book. And oh, I'm sorry cool. to say that George passed away in April this year. We were going to have lunch together in September in Homer. But the ferry had broken down. We were actually supposed to take the ferry out to Cold Bay and then a, um, a, a commuter flight out to Nelson Lagoon from there. But because the ferry broke down, we ended up going out in a single engine plane down the Alaska Peninsula. And when we came up on Nelson Lagoon, imagine your hand with your thumb sticking out and we were at the very tip. That's what a <laughs> spit looks like. And if you type in Nelson Lagoon on Google Earth and you zoom in on it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Or if you look at the picture of my book, but uh, George says, Nelson Lagoon up ahead. And I hollered from the back as I'm looking out the window at the Bering Sea and I'm I couldn't see Nelson Lagoon. What are you talking about, Nelson? He tips the plane, and I looked down at the spit, and I couldn't believe we were going to land on it. But we did, and I stayed there two years with my family. It wow. was pretty exciting. That's what the first half of the book is about, is getting used to remote Alaska. So, um, paint, you know, folks are going to be listening to this from, from all over the U.S., and they're going to think remote Alaska still has a McDonald's and a Nordstrom's <laughs> or a Wendy's or something. Paint the picture of fo for folks when you land in the plane and you get out and you see this community that's probably unlike anything you've ever seen before. Talk to me a little bit about that. 
Well, we didn't want to get out at first when the plane landed and George said, we're here, nobody moved. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why during the job fair, one of the administrators had taken a piece of paper and he put a black mark in the middle of it and he held it out for everyone to see. And he said, I want you to look real close. Do you see that? Do you see that point? That is point hope or point lay or one of those. I can't remember which. And he said, you've seen it. So if you take a job there, you get off the plane. And I couldn't figure out why anybody would not get off the plane until I landed in Nelson Lagoon. Because it was on a spit. There was water on both sides. It was 50 to 100 yards across. And uh, a handful of, I mean, today there's a little bit more there now than there was then. But a handful of houses, one school a community building that was tiny that had a post office. There was no store. There was a medical clinic. And in the medical clinic was one EMT in town. <laughs> and that was it. And it was 70. It was a uh, 45 minute flight to Cold Bay. And wow. then you would fly in from there to Anchorage, which is two and a half hours by jet. So we were way out there. In fact, Nelson Lagoon was one of the most remote places in the state, partly because of the distance and partly because there was nothing out there besides a few community members, no stores or anything, no medical, no So you activities. taught for 20 years, right? In remote places in Alaska? Yes. And the internet back then was very, it was 9,600 bits per second, which is crawling crawling so there was no I mean it was before the internet before video conferencing any of that so how is it, how important is it for these communities to have schools because you know sometimes I think it's easy for folks to think well they can just you know take a bus to the next school like that's not an option for this kind of stuff how how important are these schools in these communities they're extremely important and you need 10 students to have a school so the communities that are that small are very aware of how many children they have and when the school might close and do they need to get their sister or brother to move to town for a year or two to get them through till the next batch of kids hits the school. It's, it's a continual battle for schools that size. And these are basically, they end up being community centers kind of for the entire community because there's not many other buildings mm -hmm. in a lot of these communities besides the schools. Well, and when you think about it, my husband and I had three children and they hired us for a school that didn't have 10 children. So by the time we brought our three children, they were up to 12 and therefore they could open that school. So being teachers with kids was very important. So you did you you put in 20 years of teaching. What mm -hmm. made you take that next step to then write write the book? And uh, yeah, that's a pretty big leap of faith. When we flew into Nelson Lagoon and didn't want to get off that plane, I knew right then that this was a unique story. I started taking notes on day one. So people ask me all the time, how do you write a book? And I tell people, uh, you need to take notes on whatever it is. You need to brainstorm. But for me, I brainstormed through sticky notes for 20 years, writing down things I didn't want to forget. And I will be honest, some of those sticky notes landed in the trash because I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't take enough notes to know what every one of the notes meant. But I wrote an article once called How to Write a Book from a Thousand Sticky Notes. And um, a thousand might be on the low count. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a little insight um, about your book, maybe a glimpse into one of your favorite chapters. Okay, well, and as I'm looking for that, I just have to say my book comes in large print. So as we do the drawing, if somebody needs to have a large print just let me know and we'll send the large print instead and it comes with maps so you can Ooh, see nice. yeah yeah it's hard to pick a favorite chapter i hear a lot from people that they like the prologue so i did a prologue has me standing on a beach and i'll just read the first paragraph of it and give you a little taste i'm alone on a beach in alaska i have been isolated here for 18 months and might as well be on another planet it is winter time, and a storm is blowing mist off the Bering Sea waves as they crash onto the black sand at my feet. I cradle my frozen self and stare out across the endless white caps of the angry sea. My coat is soaked, but I don't care. I know people are out there, I remind myself, for all the good they will do me here. So it has me thinking back to what it was like to be in Detroit where I grew up. <laughs> and then I'm brought back to my reality 
when the wind is blowing and it's cold and my husband's screaming from a nearby beach for me to come in and him and the kids are sitting in the school suburban. And so I end it with, when you live in a city like Detroit, it's hard to believe there is a place like this. When you live in a place like this, it's hard to believe there's a city like Detroit. And I can't tell you how true that is standing on the Bering Sea's black sand hmm. by myself thinking about all the people I knew were in the world. It just didn't feel like it. I really felt like it was I was on another planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your your book has had su success. It's won two major awards. Mm -hmm. um, you it was have... a finalist for one of them. Nice. And and mm -hmm. you have you have a pretty decent following because you've had this blog about Alaska for a long time now. Um, yeah, that's the Alaska Bush Life. Alaska Bush Life. And we'll put all the mm -hmm. links in the description for folks to check out. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, you decided to do an audio version of your book. Talk to me about that process. Okay, so it wasn't recent. It, it, I, it was recent that it got released. So two years ago, I actually learned that you can strain your voice because I figured, well, I'll just sit down and read the whole book. And I read 10 chapters and it took me about three months before my voice sounded normal again. <laughs> that was in <laughs> September, 2020. So in the spring of 2021, I turned my closet, my walk-in closet into a recording studio. And it was so hard to get around the clothes. I was so happy when the book was finally done because I could get to my clothes again. But it took me three months to record that book. And I had a friend of mine who's a publisher, his name's Aaron Linsdow. And he came and listened to my audiobook, and he says, oh, you're going to have to do it all over again. And I was like, do it over again. Oh, my gosh. That was the hardest thing I've ever done professionally is to make an audiobook. And you wouldn't think that it would be so hard, but it's such a learning curve from the equipment to breathing, just reading and not passing out, but not breathing heavily into the mic because it's all getting recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a trick. Um I wanted to make sure that I have a couple notes here um, that my book was available to people in whatever format they wanted, which is why we made the large print. We made it in hardback, it's paperback, it's ebook, and that left just the audio book. So after Aaron Linsdow told me I needed to re record the book, I waited another two years. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I, I need a little breather on this one. <laughs> I didn't want to do it again. So I then, I guess it was, I guess it was only a year. He told me that a year and a half ago. So I re-recorded it, turned the closet back into a recording studio, this time with better equipment, spent more on the equipment. You know, when you have a book and you're an author, you have a choice. You can either hire somebody to do an audiobook. Or you can do it yourself. But if you do it yourself, there's a learning curve. There's the learning curve of all the equipment you need, the learning curve of actually how to do it. And for me, I had a unique learning curve. And I'm my husband said, oh, don't tell people about that. But I'm going to tell you that there are times that you can have somebody in a position who's a teacher, a school district administrator. I have two master's degrees, two bachelor's degrees, and I could not read out loud. So the first time I read the book, I blew through all the punctuation. I just read just, all the words. Just going 100 miles an hour. <laughs> because I couldn't breathe. I was told, my husband said, read and then breathe, then read and then breathe. And that didn't work out so well. So I was reading really fast. And the other thing is, is um, I went to one of those round schools. You're probably too young to know about this. But in the 1970s, they built round schools. And I actually attended a school that was a burned out school that the teachers volunteered. So some days they were there and some days they weren't. And the students got to choose what they wanted. And I didn't like to read. So I didn't learn to read till fifth grade. And by the time you get to fifth grade, you've passed the punctuation. You've passed learning how to sound out words. And as a school teacher, I told my students that I wasn't good at reading out loud. And I had them do it. They were better than me. So to actually create an audiobook with that kind of background was very difficult. So by the time I got to the second version of the book, I had learned to read. Nice. So that's what I learned from the book was how to read with punctuation. Hey, you're still learning stuff as a teacher that's yeah. got four degrees. <laughs> and, and I'm 56 years old. And at 56, I learned how to read punctuation. That's awesome. So yeah. 
Um, is it available basically everywhere there's an audio book or is it just on Audible, audio, the Amazon one, or is it on everything? Uh, for right now, I put it on Amazon and I think that Amazon does put it in a couple of other places besides Amazon. I'm not really sure what those places are, but I can find out and you can put it in the links. Nice. I do want to tell you there's a couple of interesting things about the audiobook. So I was listening to Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Light. Yes, I read that, that book. <laughs> and and he was so personable. He can just read fantastically. And I'm jealous. And he laughed in his book. And it, I told my husband, I said, do you remember all those clips where I was laughing that he cut out? I said, can we go back and find those? So we could only find one. So there's one point in the book. I laughed a lot when I, anytime I got to a funny spot, I couldn't help. I had to record and record and record till I could record it without laughing. So we did end up finding one that had a laugh. And the other thing is, is I listened to a book that had music in it. So if you listen to my prologue sample on Amazon, you'll hear that there's music in it. There are about 10 places and less than five minutes of music in 10 hours and 18 minute book. And some people don't like music in their book. And so it was a hard decision, but we felt like the music added to the emotion of the spots that we chose to put it in. So I added that too. Nice. And how's, how's, uh, how's it been received? Is it, my guess is people have been pretty positive about it. This is, I have not done any promotion or even told anybody about so this it. Is it. You this are is it. it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you are it. It came out on November 10th. Today is the 14th and I have been traveling when it came out. So I didn't have a chance to promote it. So you will be my first. Nice. Well, folks listening in, you need to go to amazon.com right now and you need to go type in the book name, which is The Call of the Last Frontier, and go buy the audiobook because the stories, um, I have a copy of the written book, and I'll just tell you the stories in there are um, just phenomenal. So if you grew up, maybe you grew up in Alaska, now you live in Arizona, or you you spent some college years in Alaska, and now you live in Maine, or maybe you uh, you visited Alaska in the summer, and you've always kind of nostalgically reminisced about Alaska, these stories will take you to the place where you think you're side by side with Melissa as she's teaching in these and, and living life in these very remote places in Alaska. So if you want to feel like you're going to go live in Alaska in a remote area, but you live in downtown Seattle, <laughs> go buy this book and read it and sit by the fireplace and enjoy reading it for a couple hours. Well, and John, I sent you a, a, a link to a free copy of the audiobook. Nice. You can listen to it. And then also, um, one of the things that people have said about my book is that they feel like they're part, of, that they are on the journey with me. And so if you have people in your life, if you live in Alaska and you have people in your life who don't understand because they're back home in whatever state you came from, and you want them to know what your life is like, there are a lot of things in my book that are similar to people. You don't have to live in Nelson Lagoon to have some familiarity to my story. If you live in a smaller community, if you have long commutes, if you're away from family and you miss the family events, um, then you're going to connect to my book. So because you share part of my story. So um, there's going to be folks listening here that maybe they've always wanted to write something. Maybe they've wanted to start a blog. Maybe they've um, maybe they even want to teach, right? What's some mm -hmm. advice you would give to somebody who just doesn't know where to start? Um, because you've been able to do all three things pretty well. And um, I think that um, sometimes folks either just need a little encouragement or a swift kick in the rear to get started. <laughs> well, the first thing you need to do is know who your audience is. And then also you need to know how you want to present your book. So just as I recorded my audiobook twice, I wrote my book twice. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the first time I wrote this book, I wrote it as a collection of short stories because that's how all my sticky notes came up. I made posters all around my room in my, I had set aside a room to write in. I had a desk in there and I had posters on the wall and I put all the stickies that I had. I truly did have all these sticky notes. And I posted them under topics, flying stories, bear stories, fairy stories, storms stories. And I put them all on those sticky notes. And then I wrote short stories. 
And that didn't work because then my book was just constant story after story after story, every few paragraphs. And so I threw the book away and just like, like this audiobook, I waited a long time before I got back to it. And when I came back to it, people told me it's a memoir and I fought it. No, it's not a memoir. <laughs> it's a memoir. I don't want it to be a memoir. Well, it's a memoir. So I wrote it chronologically as a memoir. And uh, so knowing who your audience is, and for me, it was knowing that my audience were memoir readers and yeah. my audience were adventure readers, people who are interested in your story. And that was really hard for me when, when they would say, okay, who's your audience? How do you know who your audience is? I didn't know. How do you know who's interested in your, your book? And I didn't know how to find that out. So I'm going to tell you how to find that out. Find an author who wrote a book similar to what you think your book is. Look at the categories that they have it listed under. If you scroll down to the metadata, and see if you can contact that authors. Authors are just people yeah. and they help each other. So talk to other authors and find out how to figure out who your audience is. So for me, I know that majority of my audience are 40 and up. They're people who are venture seekers, teachers, uh, people who want to know what it's like to live in Alaska, people who want to visit or have visited or have lived or have family who live there. Uh, those are my audience and then trying to figure out where your audience is on all the different social medias because if you want to write a book and you want to make money from it you have to sell it which means you have to know where your audience is which is another good question for those authors based on whatever your topic is yeah so you did a lot of research on this <laughs> I learned the hard way, trial and error with a yeah. lot of, how do you find this out? And the end answer to that is talk to other authors. They're out there and they will help you. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. we've, we've just went through 25 minutes just in a flash. Do you have mm -hmm. any last minute thoughts, Melissa, before we head off? Well, I had this person named Thomas Harris leave me a review on Amazon. And I, mean, I looked through the reviews today and, and, I just have to say, this is my favorite. I won't read the whole part, but I'll read what he said. The Call of the Last Frontier by Melissa Cook is by far the best book I've ever read. She captivates you constantly with her funny, serious, and adventurous stories of living and teaching in schools in Alaska. And I just loved that quote. So That's awesome. So folks listening, go to Amazon.com uh, and go buy this book. We're going to put the link in the description. I want to really encourage people to check this out. We have no paid partnership or anything with Melissa. I just think her book's awesome. And I think that she has done a wonderful job of telling her story in a way that makes you feel like you're sitting there right with her uh, in the midst of what happens in remote Alaska. So um, thanks for joining us, folks. And again, you could win a copy of this book. We're going to give away two books. All you got to do is go to the Must Read Alaska page. I'm going to pin this full-length video interview to the top of the page. And all you have to do is do one of four things, like, comment, share, or tag a friend, and you'll be entered to win. You can do all four and get four entries. On Sunday, I'll pick two winners. And uh, I think we're going to ship off signed copies. Is that what yes. we're thinking? Awesome. And if they could say if they need a large print. Yes. And then and, and we'll contact the winners and, and see if they need a large print. So um, thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us. For folks listening in, if you listen, watch, or read Must Read Alaska, we want to thank you for doing that. If you want to sponsor the Must Read Alaska show, send me an email, john at mustreadalaska.com. That's J-O-H-N at mustreadalaska.com. And until next time, I'm John from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you.